Hi, welcome back to all. Uh, next talk is from Phil G. Van Z from the University of Texas at Austin. He will be giving us an overview to the Bliss framework. Over to you, Phil. Yes, thank you. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Field Van Z, and I'm from the Science of High Performance Computing Group at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm gonna to be talking about this framework. So let's jump right in. What is BLISS? BLISS is an acronym. Uh, it stands for BLAS-like library instantiation software. It is a framework for quickly instantiating high performance uh, BLAS and BLAS-like libraries. And you might be thinking, why, why BLAS-like? Um, what's wrong with the BLAS? Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but for now, just assume that BLAS-like is synonymous with BLAS. So what are the BLAS? The BLAS are also an acronym for the basic linear algebra subprograms. It was unrolled in three families, uh, which they call levels, level one, two, and three, which address different types of dense linear algebra operations. So the level one operations were vector operations uh, exclusively. Level two were operations that deal with mixed matrix and vector operands. And level three, which are the most computationally intensive, are operations where all operands are matrices. So why are the laws important? The blahs constitute the bottom of the food chain, as we like to say sometimes, uh, for most densely linear algebra applications, as well as some libraries, such as LAPAC and Liplane. The idea is pretty simple. It's that if, if the blahs interface is standardized, or at least agreed upon, and uh, if an optimized impl implementation exists for your hardware, then higher level applications can portably access high performance. It was, it was really a key contribution for the time. Uh, and just to give you a, a sense of what operations are available in each of the levels, uh, an example of a level one operation would be um, a vector copy or a dot product or a so-called AXPE operation. Level two operations constitute uh, things like general matrix vector multiplication or Hermitian rank one update. And level three, which are probably the most uh, famous and, and certainly the most computationally intensive are things like general matrix multiply and triangular matrix multiply triangular solve with multiple right-hand sides. I would say that the level three operations form the, the bread and butter of most uh, dense linear algebra applications and uh, related high performance computing applications. There are plenty of implementations available through both vendors and uh, open source projects. So why do we need Bliss? There's actually two questions here. The first is why do we need Bliss? And the second is why should we want Bliss even if we don't need it? So we'll look at the first question first. Why do we need Bliss? Well, unfortunately, the BLAS interface, the API itself is, is quite limiting for some applications. And this should not surprise anyone because it was finalized 30 years ago. So I'll give you some examples of how the interface is limited. Uh, the interface itself, all, all levels, one, two, and three, um, or rather two and three, when you're dealing with an operation that takes uh, a matrix for one of its operands, that matrix must be stored in column major format. So for those of you who don't intuitively understand column major storage, it's simply a mapping of matrix elements to memory such that columns are contiguous. 
There's also row major storage, which is not directly supported by the BLAS, although it is supported by the C BLAS, which is a, uh, a layer that can sit on top of the BLAS option. And we want to be able to support that as well. We also want to be able to support uh, so-called general stride storage. Um, and general stride storage, uh, to try to put it succinctly, is simply storage where the, uh, there is not contiguity in either dimension. Um, all elements are non-contiguous with all other elements. And further yet, we want to be able to mix the storage formats within a single operation call. So maybe we want to multiply a column major matrix by a row major matrix and then use that product to update a general stride matrix. By the way, why do we even need general stride storage? It's certainly not. Uh, it's certainly not the kind of storage you would reach for for modern computers, given the emphasis on uh, contiguous access. But suppose you have a three-dimensional tensor, which I've tried to illustrate here, just a stack of column major matrices. And we want to take an arbitrary slice, and the slice that we want happens to be in this plane. Well, if you look carefully, all of those elements are non-contiguous. So how would we even refer to such a matrix in the BLAS? The short answer is you can't. You would have to make a temporary copy of your matrix. And that copy would have to be stored in column major format. And then you could proceed with your, your computation. And then afterward, you would have to update uh, this original matrix, if, if that was the idea. Another way the BLAS interface is limiting is that it has incomplete support for complex operations. Uh, this, is, this is getting really into the weeds, but uh, to put it simply, there are no instances in the BLAS where you can simply conjugate an operand implicitly as part of the operation. You can transpose, you can Hermitian transpose, um, which is a conjugation and a transposition, but you can't just conjugate. And I, I cannot for the life of me imagine why that was left out aside from that it's not used very often. But uh, for those who need it, you know, certainly that statistic does not uh, really come with any comfort, right? The BLAS API is also opaque. There's no uh, agreed upon way to access the lower level kernels. It's really going to be heavily implementation dependent. So maybe the library will export access to those APIs, maybe it doesn't, uh, but there's, there's no standard there. Some examples of why you might wanna access these kernels are maybe you're trying to optimize a, a higher level library, or maybe you're trying to implement a new BLAS-like operation without reinventing everything from scratch. Or maybe you're trying to conduct research on the kernels themselves to maybe perform some performance measurements. Operation support also has not changed in these last three decades. Um, it's really just the same BLAS operations that were available from the start that, that are present in modern BLAS libraries. There was a forum uh, around 2000, 2001, I believe, um, that attempted to ratify some improvements, uh, but those improvements were largely ignored by subsequent implementers, both open source and commercial. Uh, I say largely because I think there are some select operations that were picked up here and there, but certainly nothing uh, standardized. And we think that this was simply because there was no reference implementation for all of these extensions that were proposed at the forum. But that's just our speculation. So why does any of this mean we, we need Bliss? Well, the BLAS API is static and it can't be improved. We, we can't gain access to a better API 
by building a better laws. We need something else altogether. When building laws, the only choice you have is how you implement it, not the API that you export. So this was one of the primary motivations for developing Bliss is that we wanted to improve not only the implementation, but the interface as well. So Bliss addresses these interface issues uh, in the following ways, which address the, the very shortcomings that we discussed a few moments ago. Uh, we now have independent row and column stride properties, so we can uh, we can store matrices in column row or general stride with equal ease. Any input operand can be conjugated. You can access lower level packing and computation kernels if you so choose, if that is of interest to you. And operation support can grow over time uh, as needed. And this is why we refer to the B in Bliss as blas like is that we don't see ourselves uh, wedded to just what was in the original Bloss. This is why Bliss needs to exist. Uh, these features are simply absent uh, by, by and large from other Bloss implementations. There is no other game in town if these are the features that you need. So now let's move on to the second question. Why should we want Bliss, even if we don't need it? Well, you, yeah, you still might want to use it even if the features aren't absolutely critical to you. Um, if you're an end user, you would gain access to improved APIs. And uh, if you changed your mind, didn't want to use this APIs, you could still use the compatibility layer, which exports classic laws and CBLIS. And as a developer, Bliss would make it easier to implement new libraries uh, on new hardware. So most of the work has, would have been done for you. You just have to plug in a few missing pieces and parameters, and off you go. So how does Bliss make it easier to implement high performance Bloss libraries? Let's start by looking at how general matrix multiplication, which is sort of the prototypical classic operation of the level three family. Let's look at how that operation was implemented by Kazushige Goto in the Goto Bloss. And for those of you who don't know, the Goto Bloss was the predecessor to Open Bloss. And Kazushige Goto actually worked here at the University of Texas at Austin for a period of time in the, uh, in the aughts. I believe maybe from 2003 or four until the end of that decade. And this research was first published in an ACM Tom's article in 2008. So Goto's, al we, we now call it the Goto algorithm. Uh, Goto's algorithm for matrix multiplication was built to atop what he called an inner kernel, or sometimes he just called it a kernel. And that kernel consisted of three loops um, around a tiny outer product. And the whole thing was written in assembly. And on top of that kernel were three other loops. So I've tried to illustrate that. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Goto algorithm, uh, as performant as it was at the time, it came with several drawbacks, especially when looked at through the lens of implementing an entire Blas library, uh, specifically the entire level three family. And we'll go over each one of these, uh, these items a little in more detail, but just to go through them quickly, uh, you couldn't take this one inner kernel for gem and recycle it easily for every other level three operation. And this kernel was quite large. Uh, it consisted of three loops, more or less. It's a little more complicated than that, but we'll just say it's three loops. And the footprint was, uh, it, it wasn't, it's not fun to, to read. I invite any of you, if you're curious, just to open open blahs or go to blahs and, and look inside the kernel and I think you'll understand uh, what I'm talking about. It, it's very difficult for newcomers to come along and learn how it works or debug it or anything like that. 
Edge cases also had to be handled explicitly. And uh, you can't really parallelize anything in here because it's all assembly. Um, I mean, I suppose maybe you could you could do so, but I don't know anyone who, who likes to do parallelism in assembly regions. So let's look at the first item, recycling kernels. Why can't we recycle that kernel? It actually has to do with the differences between the level three operations. So all of the level three operations, except for the last one, are matrix multiplication, but they're different kinds of matrix multiplication. So for example, in the case of triangular matrix multiplication, the idea is to multiply a triangular matrix, which means we have useful entries on and in this case, below the diagonal and zeros above. We want to multiply this matrix by an, another dense matrix, but we want to do so without computing with these zeros. Uh, we don't want to waste those computations because we know anything multiplied by zero is zero. So in theory, this should take roughly half the time, half the flops of uh, a gem, a comparable gem. So it turns out that uh, we need variance for lower and upper triangular because you can store in either triangle. And uh, the, the triangle that you store in depends on what direction you move through the, uh, through the matrix. And it turns out that when you're multiplying with these blocks along the diagonal, the innermost loop bound in this direction, uh, it depends on where you are in this loop. So that adds extra complexity and, and nuance there that simply is not a part of the original gem. OK, let's look at the assembly code footprint. Um, why is it so big? Well, it's three loops in assembly, and there's lots of unrolling, and there's lots of edge case handling. And it gets complicated in a hurry. Uh, I, you know, I don't really know how else to convey that um, without going into gory details, but uh, just trust me there. Or look at the kernel yourself if you, if you care. So I, I invite you to. So these edge cases, um, the inner kernels has uh, a fundamental size. Um, these register block sizes we call MR and NR, and they're based on the register allocation that we use in this innermost loop, as well as the, uh, the subsequent packing widths uh, that are sort of implied here. Some examples are in modern day Intel and AMD architectures, you might see an MR of six and an MR of eight. So these are quite small. But, uh, but these block sizes, uh, they, the reason they're germane to the edge cases is because once you define the sort of blocking parameter, you have to say, well, what happens when the matrix is not a clean multiple of those block sizes? you end up with um, these leftover regions at the end where you could have an edge case. And these edge cases, uh, so, you know, the normal case with no edge, uh, I've illustrated here as a six by eight, uh, but you have to have lots of logic to handle, you know, these cases where maybe your NR is not eight, maybe you have a leftover of four, or maybe you have a leftover of five and you handle it by composing the six by four and the six by one. And of course, this doesn't happen in the M dimension as well. Uh, and then everything in between. So uh, I, just ballparking it, I, I could venture to say that the, uh, the go to inner kernel is less than 50% uh, belonging to the interior case. Uh, I, I think more than half of it is edge case handling. And that, of course, results in a lot of assembly code bloat when, it, when it's all written in assembly. Moving on to parallelization, this inner kernel is an indivisible unit. You, you can't really break it up for parallelism. Uh, you have to obtain your parallelism at a higher level in, in the loops that. Uh, surround this kernel. Okay, so 
let's we've we've talked a little bit about the Goto approach and its drawbacks. So let's now talk about Bliss. Uh, how does Bliss make any of this easier? Hopefully it does. Uh, and in case you're curious, we published a paper in ACM Toms in 2015 that uh, introduced Bliss. So the first and biggest change in the Bliss implementation of the Goto algorithm, because it does use the same overall algorithm roughly, is that it isolates a smaller kernel, and we call it the microkernel. And once again, it's just uh, it's a single loop around this very tiny outer product. This microkernel design confers several benefits over uh, Goto's inner kernel. And uh, those are simply uh, represented by the, the four topics we just discussed. Uh, the recyclability is there. Um, because we now have a smaller kernel, uh, the microkernel itself is actually uh, can be recycled between the various level three operations, which I'll get to in a little bit. It requires fewer lines of assembly because it encompasses a smaller unit of computation. It allows edge cases to be handled portably, and it exposes more opportunities for parameters. So let's go through these. Um, these outer two loops were once buried in assembly code in the Goto approach. And we've now factored these two loops out of the assembly region. And we now express them in C, just regular C code. And it turns out that virtually all of the differences between the level three operations existed within these two loops. So by factoring them out into C99, we no longer need different assembly kernels for different level three operations. Uh, all of those differences fall away. And so now our microkernel has shrunken down to about 2,000 lines of assembly, whereas before it was about 5,000. And the two loops that we factored out, they're quite small. We're talking about 200 lines of assembly, uh, C, and much of that is white space and comments and things like that. So uh, this was really a no-brainer for us. It's a win-win-win. And the microkernel, it only consists of one loop and no edge cases. So um, you might be thinking, well, how do, we, how do we do that? If the edge cases aren't handled in the microkernel, how are they handled? Which is a good question. So the Bliss uh, framework, it only requires the kernel developer to focus on this main case in this um, situation, the six by eight. When an edge case is encountered in a level three operation, Bliss uses uh, the following uh, set of steps to handle them. So it takes the small edge case, it copies it to a, a full tile, it zero fills, uh, what the the data that corresponds to data that actually did not ever exist in the original matrix. It then computes the microkernel normally, and these these panels have already been zero filled during the the packing step. And then it takes the result and copies it back. This does come with a small performance penalty. Uh, you know, maybe a, a couple percent. And that it should be pretty obvious, you know, because these copies are not free, the zero filling is not free. Um, and these extra computations with zeros, they don't buy you anything. You don't get any credit for doing those computations with zeros. Um, they don't add to the flop count of the operation. But we do this anyways, because we think this trade-off between performance and productivity is worth it, that allowing the developer to focus on the one microkernel, uh, and that's all he or she needs to get up and running, uh, we, think, we think that's a worthwhile trade. Moving on to parallelism, it turns out that this microkernel design also, in exposing these two loops, 
it also exposes more opportunities for parallelism. Uh, whereas this whole unit used to be in assembly, now you can optionally parallelize either one of these loops in addition to the loops above it. And having more opportunities for parallelism is always better. Uh, in, in dense linear algebra, it, just, it, it tends to lead to better load balancing and smoother results, and also uh, better scalability. Now the microkernel. Uh, let's just briefly talk, how is it implemented? So I've depicted it here. We have our small tile, and uh, we're multiplying it by this, these uh, long panels. It's really quite straightforward. Uh, you drop into a loop, and within that loop, you perform some, uh, some vector loads on matrix A to load into a vector or vectors. And then you similarly load elements of B into registers. You perform this outer product. The result of this outer product is then accumulated into uh, a set of accumulator registers, which roughly correspond to the elements of the C matrix that you're updating. These are kept in registers as you iterate through the loop. And after the loop, you take these values and you write them back out to memory. Some of you may have noticed that the algorithm here, this little diagram, it contains lots of blocking parameters. I've highlighted 12 here, but there's really just five. There's NC, there's KC, MC, NR, and MR. And the alphabet soup is decoded as follows. The, the MNK simply refers to the dimension that you are blocking over. And the C or the R refers to whether it's a cache block size or a register block size. So these three are all cache block sizes, and these two are register block sizes. How are they chosen? Uh, you might think that the first thing we reach for is some sort of empirical search. And this is actually the approach that Atlas took uh, for a long time. But one of our collaborators showed in a paper in ACM Toms in 2016 that you could build an analytical model, uh, you know, something that you scribble on the whiteboard or you can punch into a spreadsheet that will give you very good approximations for um, these blocking parameters that give you high performance. And uh, Sometimes they can be tweaked beyond there, but it, it definitely puts you uh, very close to what we believe is optimal. I'm not going to spend too much time on packing other than uh, to say that Bliss handles packing of all the types of matrices that would be in the BLAS, general, symmetric, Hermitian, and triangular. And uh, they have to be highly parameterized because there's different situations um, where you would need to pack them slightly differently or the, op the operation uses them slightly differently. And it turns out that having the row and column strides uh, allows us to collapse a lot of that complexity. So that's a, it's another way that we, we know we made the right design decision by having the row and column strides. So in summary, Bliss factors out as much complexity complexity as possible from the performance sensitive kernel code, leaving only the microkernel. It significantly reduces the size and complexity of the kernels that have to be optimized. It provides generic portable instances of factored codes, as well as the higher level blocking algorithms. And it provides all the packing functionality uh, with no modification required beyond uh, just parameterization. So for those of you still with me, uh, I'm ready to show you some performance. Uh, thank you for your patience on that. Uh, we were grateful enough, or lucky enough rather, to have access to the Epic 7742, which is their top of the line 128 core server. And so I'm going to show you results that I gathered on that server. But before I show you those results, I want to 
review how to interpret our graphs. So here I have an example graph on the right. In this particular graph, the x-axis shows the problem size where all matrix dimensions are equal. So we have square matrices here. The y-axis is our preferred measure of performance uh, expressed in billions of floating point operations per second or gigaflops. And we scale the y-axis so that the top of the graph is the theoretical peak performance of the machine. So you'll, we'll, never, we'll never hit the top of the graph, but the idea is to get as close as possible. And we compare Bliss to uh, some other implementations provided by OpenBLAS, Eigen, and OpenKL. The nice thing about the way we scale the y-axis is that not only can we compare each implementation to one another and, and get a relative sense of their performance, but we can also compare each implementation to the theoretical peak and get a, an absolute sense of how well they're doing. And we're going to do this for a representative sample of level three operations on all four floating point data types. Yes, Bart. We, yeah, we can take questions now or we can wait to the end field. That's up to you. Um, that's actually probably good. So Bart, if you don't mind, could you write down your question and, and hold it till the end? Because we'll have plenty of time at the end, I think. Thank you. Yes, makes sense. OK, so now that you understand how to interpret one of these graphs, and, and of course here, the alphabet soup is the, uh, this first character is the data type, the precision and the domain of the matrices. And then the rest is the operation name. Okay, so here we have single threaded results. We have gem, symmetric and Hermitian matrix multiply, symmetric and Hermitian rank K update, triangular matrix multiplication, and triangular solid with multiple hand signs for single precision real, double precision real, single precision complex, double precision complex. Okay, so uh, I, I put the legend only in one graph just to declutter the, the, the whole picture for you. So uh, it's probably common knowledge that MKL is a, a bit crippled on AMD hardware, and this, this is intentional. It appears, I don't know why Intel made that decision, but uh, one exception is DGEM. They, they're okay with MKL doing well for DGEM. Uh, it seems that they're less okay with it doing well for the other level three operations. And then for other data types, you know, it just, um, they completely fall back to generic kernels. Um, we think it's simply because they, they, are interpreting the CPU ID instruction. And the first thing they see is that it's not, that the vendor field is not Intel. And then at that point, they just sort of throw up their hands and say, we're gonna just pretend like it's a you know, 2006 era SSE system and use SSE kernels. But the moral of the story here for this graph is that Bliss performs consistently well across all operations for all data types. There are, no, there are no Achilles heels with Bliss where you point to an operation and say, oh, you forgot to optimize that operation. Because of our holistic approach, where we try to um, encode as much functionality with as little code as possible, uh, a natural byproduct of that is that we, we get to hit everything equally. Uh, there are no favorites, really. We, we try to optimize every operation by virtue of the fact that we optimize the, the, the matrix multiplication itself well. Okay, so next, multi-threading. You might be thinking, well, single-threaded is all fine and good, but show me multiple cores. So Bliss definitely supports multi-threading. Uh, we have four loops that are eligible for parallelism. This innermost loop is, is much, much too low level to parallelize, so we disqualify that one. And then this loop right here, we have not parallelized it yet because it would require some synchronization. 
for those of you who uh, are a little more familiar with dense linear algebra, each of these subproblems is, is updating the same matrix. So we would have to have a way for the threads to cooperatively not step on each other's toes when updating the C matrix. And it's possible we just haven't gotten around to it yet. And you can parallelize more than one loop at one time. And, and we do. Uh, and to give you a sense, uh, parallelism can be controlled simply by setting some environment variables beforehand. And we support both OpenMP and POSIX threads. We prefer OpenMP because we get the uh, we get some thread affinity uh, functionality that is particularly useful. So I'm going to use the same hardware as before. This is a two socket 64 four uh, socket per socket system. The top of the graph still represents peak performance, but we're now showing you gigafunnels per core. So we've normalized the y-axis. And we're comp comparing to the same implementations as before. So once again, right off the bat, you can see Bliss uh, dominates consistently, whereas the others struggle a bit. Um, something else you might notice is that Eigen is only present on the gem graphs. And that is no mistake. Um, Eigen does not appear to, at least last I checked, does not appear to parallelize uh, any of the other level three operations. And uh, so this, uh, we have 64 threads here. This is, this is one socket fully engaged, all cores. And here I have some alphabet soup that encodes how many ways of parallelism we got from each loop. So we got four ways of parallelism from the JC loop or from the IC loop or from the JR loop. The total number of threads is the product of those ways of parallelism. And um, so I think the most interesting part of this graph is not MKL, but rather OpenBlas, because we, we consider OpenBlas sort of our primary competitor since we're on even footing. We're both open source projects, um, you know, unlike MKL, which is a commercial product. And uh, sometimes, uh, OpenBlas does, you know, quite well, but other times they do less well. And I, I could not really venture to guess as to why uh, they struggle with some of these operations, but, uh, but it's interesting. And then now we have 128 threads. So both sockets fully engaged, all cores. Uh, you know, the, the system is firing the mouse cylinders now. And in this configuration, the other, the competition starts to fall away. Um, you know, the only one who gets kind of close is MKL for DGEM. You know, we've discussed already that they, they don't seem to be opposed to DGEM performing decently on AMD hardware, but for the rest, um, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, this may be that these, these other operations are not optimized well, this, this could be a NUMA effect. I'm not really sure. But, uh, but it, it's not difficult to get this performance with Bliss. Uh, you can certainly reproduce it using what the information I've provided on the web. So to wind things down a little bit now, uh, we have multiple publications that, that report on many of the uh, innovations that I've touched on today. We have seven uh, mainline Bliss papers, papers that deal what we would call directly with Bliss. Uh, we also have a number of publications that were authored by collaborators of ours, uh, friends and collaborators. And uh, you know, one of the great things about Bliss that we're quite proud of is that not only has it allowed us to create this new library that it itself by itself is quite useful to many people. But it has allowed uh, and facilitated other related research in adjacent fields. So there's now a tensor bliss library. Um, it's been used to uh, tackle some machine learning kernels, the, the k-nearest neighbor kernel. And it's also been applied to Strassen's algorithm, which many of you are probably familiar with. We've been fortunate enough to 
have uh, funding, generous funding from the National Science Foundation. We have several awards. And this, is, this has been sort of the bread and butter of, of our funding. But we've also received uh, some gifts and grants and hardware from industry over the years. So the takeaway for today that, uh, that I'd like you to, to have is that bliss is more than just blahs. Um, it, it certainly can be used as blahs, but, but bliss is really a superset of blahs. In some ways, I would like to think that if we were going to do blahs over, uh, you know, go back in time and, and try, to, uh, try to do it over again, bliss is, is closer to what it would look like. It benefits uh, even the most basic of end users uh, through a more flexible interface. It benefits developers by providing a portable framework that allows them to uh, quickly instantiate libraries on new hardware with only focusing on a small amount of assembly code that needs to be optimized to maintain. And it also allows infrastructure for implementing new operations if that's what they need. It also benefits researchers and experts by providing low level access to kernels and providing a platform for experimentation and prototyping. And we even have a foundation for mixed domain and mixed precision operations, which I haven't even discussed today. Um, and Bliss benefits everyone through uh, facilitating high performance, providing what we would like to think is reasonably compact and readable code. And of course, it's free and open source software available under a three clause BSD license. So, um, you know, there's no, there's no hiding things under the covers, uh, trying to keep it proprietary. It's, it's open for anyone to use, uh, for anyone to look at. And of course, we're very, we're very happy with the community that has co uh, coalesced around this over the years. So that's it for my talk. Um, it looks like we have time. I, I also have backup slides uh, that we can look at maybe in the breakout room. Uh, lots of topics that, uh, you know, it was just too much for, for one talk, but, um, you know, certainly I'm happy to continue talking about it uh, later on. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Field. Um, yep, we've got questions. I'm going to hand over to Bart first. <coughs> Uh, yes. Hello, Field. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I have uh, two questions. The uh, first one is uh, a bit more technical. Uh, I, I can gather that by using less assembly in Bliss than in Open Blast or Code to Blast, you also mm -hmm. have uh, less trouble in that way because one of the things we've been seeing with Open Blast is that as compilers get more aggressive, they kind of um, they expose bugs in the inline assembly kernels. Uh, like they often TCC inline assembly syntax, they forgot to, to save certain uh, factor registers and things like that. So I am asking this, is Bliss more immune to that? I suppose so. Um, I would like to think, that, I mean, first of all, I wanna you know reaffirm that you are, you're not the only one who has encountered these, these types of bugs. Um, you know, I, I recall one of our undergraduate students, he worked on a, uh, on the Power 9 system. Uh, last year, he, you know, we had an undergraduate, <laughs> we're actually quite proud of this. So we had an undergraduate computer science uh, major who, with the help of Bliss, uh, he wrote the highest performance uh, IBM Power 9 implementation of DGEM that we are aware of. In other words, it, it beat the, the IBM vendor library. Uh, but that, you know, that little bit of bragging aside, one of the things he encountered was that he had to use the GNU compiler because the IBM compiler had some type of register allocation bug where with the, ex the pr exact same code, it would give us errors in terms of, you know, not being able to use certain registers. So, um, you know, if that's the type of bug that you're concerned about, um, we haven't encountered it very much on Intel uh, hardware at all. 
uh, th that was actually the first time I encountered it just sort of in the abstract in the, in the IBM setting. But uh, certainly, you know, the fact that our code is simpler, you know, one could suppose that that means that there's, there's less register allocation juggling that the compiler has to do. And furthermore, because it's in assembly rather than intrinsics, the register allocation is mostly prescribed. And um, it's really just a matter of the compiler uh, accepting the registers that we're trying to use as valid registers. Yeah, it's 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 almost what I'm saying. What I'm what we've been seeing with Open Blast has been a bit frustrating in recent years. Is that that uh, um, um, as compilers uh, as we get newer compiler releases, they start to get more aggressive with the register allocation. It's, it just exposes bugs in, in mm -hmm. Open Blast that sometimes have been there for more than ten years, maybe even written by Kotu himself. So it's. Uh, is really quite astounding, but that, 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 that's only more of a benefit of reducing your amount of, amount of assembly language because instead of having to fix it in one place, if it ever happens, uh, yeah, absolutely, we, 10 places in open blast sometimes. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, so, you know, rest assured that um, if those bugs ever come up, come up, we will, we will, you know, immediately try to fix them, but we have not. It has not really been a, an issue for us, thankfully. Yeah, no, no, that's good. And the second question is, from a user perspective, we're 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 seeing AMD advertising their own uh, Bliss, like AMD Bliss, but I also see that AMD has contributed back into the upstream Bliss. So can you comment a bit on that, how these two relate to each other at the present time? Yes, and I uh, forgive me that you know with the connection I wasn't. Uh, I couldn't hear every word you, you said, but it sounds like you're asking me to simply uh, say a few words on the the similarities and differences bet between you know vanilla bliss and AMD bliss. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So good, great question. Um, so vanilla, let me just make one thing clear. Vanilla bliss came first. Um, we we at the University of Texas, along with our collaborators. We are the original authors of Bliss. Um, around 2015, uh, AMD came to us, and they, basically this was kind of at the point when they were in um, a, a more difficult financial situation, by, by my understanding. And uh, I think they, they had to let go of some of their people. And they, they used to have a vendor library, like Laws Library, it was called ACML, and I believe it was completely scrapped in favor of open source solutions. So, that, you know, I think that the company changed their strategy so that rather than try to maintain all of that code in-house, they wanted to build on open source software going forward. Now, they weren't, they weren't opposed to having, you know, slight customizations, but they didn't want to have to build everything from scratch themselves. They wanted to take something open source as a starting point. And so for the Blas component of their software stack, they decided to use Bliss. And ever since then, they have been uh, you know, using Bliss, uh, apparently to great effect, to optimize for their, their Zen architectures. Now, in my experience, limited experience, granted, I don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time using AMD Bliss, but uh, uh, there, there is not as much forking or fragmentation as you might think between the two. Uh, we, we try to keep the two roughly synchronized in the sense that, uh, you know, I know AMD likes to, to take major innovations that I push into the vanilla branch, the, the vanilla repository, and they try to integrate those into AMD Bliss. And similarly, you know, big uh, contributions to AMD Bliss, I try to merge those back into vanilla. So, um, you know, it, I think for most casual users, in my opinion, they are fine just using Vanilla Bliss. Uh, the nice thing about using Vanilla Bliss is that 
we can provide support to you as the authors of Bliss. Uh, we, we cannot provide support to AMD Bliss. So uh, that's one consideration is if you find a bug in Bliss um, and it looks like it's in an AMD specific portion, then we may not be able to help you. Is there a question? Yeah, that, 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 that kind of answers my questions that they're kind of rolling at different, at slightly different speeds. So one one time particular subcase can work better in AMD, Blast, or in Vanilla Bliss. Uh, it, but it's it's good to see that you have cross contribution between the two. Yeah. Okay. And feel just just something small to to clarify there. It's not actually AMD contributing back to Blizz, it's you keeping an eye on what they are doing and, and pulling in what makes sense. I mean, it's a little bit in between, but that's a fair point. Um, they they do not have push privileges to the, the upstream uh, repository, but they can submit pull requests. And the way it works is that I will review the pull request. I will often go through it and make changes and, you know, really vet it and put it because I, I do have a high standard for for the code that goes into Bliss. Uh, it's one of the ways that I've kept it so uh, neat and organized and well maintained over the years. So, uh, but but certainly they they have thanks to AMD support and their their you know involvement. They have certainly pushed us to include certain things in Bliss that maybe would not have been included or it would have taken longer to include on our own on our own timeline. It looks like there's other participants um, who have questions, is that right? Yes, pass across to OK now. <clears throat> yes, OK Sangren here. Um, first of all, uh, is the performance pattern the same if you're doing matrices where M and K is not the same? Good question. Compared to, you haven't checked? Yeah, so um, the, well, you're, it, it sounds like you're asking, is the performance signature or is the, is the code path the same? No, 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 the, the, thing, the, the graphs you were showing, would sure, they look sure. the same for, for, for a elongated yeah. matrices? Yeah, so, it's, so the short answer is it depends on how elongated. Um, so if, if we're just talking about a, you know, a, a ratio of like two to one or three to one, then we would expect that uh, performance signature to roughly mimic what, what you saw in the presentation. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about very skinny matrices where you, know, you might have a small dimension of 10, and then the large dimension of 10,000. Uh, then for those problem cases, we actually have an entirely different code path that activates because when you have these so-called skinny matrices, uh, it turns out that the, the packing step uh, becomes prohibitive or it can be prohibitive. So we, we have a different set of algorithms and kernels that don't require any packing at all. And that actually, that was a project that was, uh, that was funded by AMD. Uh, it's a good example of one of these things where maybe we would have done it eventually, but they certainly prodded us to do it sooner. And uh, I have a whole other set of performance graphs that shows performance on so-called skinny matrices. Uh, and and that, you know, that's, that's another topic, but we're, we're quite pleased with how Bliss performs under those conditions as well. Uh, oftentimes we, in some cases, we outperform MKL even on Intel hardware. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, we're pleased with that. It's, it's highly dependent though on the specifics of, you know, is there one a tiny dimension? Are there two tiny dimensions? You know, how tiny is tiny? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really going to depend. Yeah, Gen generally good anyway. Uh, the second question is, have you verified your code against uninitialized data use? Uninitialized data. Okay, so that's a great question. 
So I, it sounds like what you are asking is, well, let me let me clarify. So when you say un, uninitialized data, do you mean for the matrices like ABC, or are you referring to having Re valid? Register, yeah, having valid data in in the operations. One of the bugs I I happened to find back in I think it was Gotoblast was that uh, one of the SIMD operations uh, used a value that it shouldn't. It 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 loaded more data than it should. Yes, I, I actually heard about that bug from a from a collaborator at my last place of employment. Uh, so we. Um, if it makes you feel better, I have run Valgrind on, um, so in terms of things like memory leaks, we know we're good there. Uh, we do also run various test suites, including the, the official BLAS test suite that is part of LAPAC. Yeah. Uh, and those run automatically through continuous integration every time we do a commit. So they're, they're always running. Uh, and we think it's a pretty good, you know, it's a pretty good correlate to saying we don't get very many regression bugs, but, uh, you know, it's always possible there's something out there that, of, the, of the kind that you've described. Yeah. But generally speaking, we we're quite confident that uh, the kernels are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. That's usually one of the things I like to test. And that's using the Intel compiler with with the check on in it flag turned on, for instance. That's really right. funny. <laughs> well, yeah. not so funny on most codes, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another another thing that we're careful about is that uh, when we are updating uninitialized matrices, so A times B to overwrite C. Um, so when you set your beta to zero, the naive approach would be, you know, you could just multiply C by zero, but if you have infinities or NANDs, you know, you can get some, you know, yeah. uh, propagation, of course. So you, in the case where beta is zero, you have to overwrite C and, and clobber it all together. Um, and we're, we're careful to do that as well. Yeah. Good. Hand to Victor for the question now. I just have uh, two naive questions for someone who doesn't understand about linear algebra that well. So would there be any version of cool please, rock please, hip please in vision or this only CPU version of please? That's actually a great question, Victor. Um, so the you've, you've hit on a really key point, which is, um, the GPU implementation of any sort of BLAS type library would potentially be quite different than the CPU implementation. We at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, we like to focus on what we know and what we know we're good at, which is in at this point in time, the CPU only uh, side of things. But we do have um, collaborators out there uh, in academia, granted, so they're not as you know focused on creating you know commercial grade products, but th there there are others out there who who do the who are on the GPU side. Um, we've gotten lots and lots of questions about you know when are you going to do GPU Bliss and can you do GPU Bliss? Can we can we give you money so you can do GPU Bliss? <laughs> uh, so, but for now, you know, we have a very, very small group at the University of Texas and we're not comfortable taking on those extra things at this time, but, um, but yes, yeah, so for now, the, the presentation that I gave you, it's all, that was all about the CPU side only. And question number two is related to, again, as a naive question, do you have any real need to write assembly code? Is there any way you can wrap up this thing into, I don't know, is some sort of SIMD or any other type of library can make it like a, a different level of writing this, making it even more portable? Yeah, so that's another great question, Victor. Uh, so one, one approach would be sort of a, a, a light approach, which would be, you know, basically do the same thing we're doing now, except instead of assembly, you could write intrinsics, okay? 
So yeah. intrinsics are a little bit easier to use, right? Uh, but the problem with intrinsics that we found in the past is that, you know, if your compiler happens to regress in terms of its its register allocation, uh, you know, uh, register allocator, you can get a lot of you can get spillover into memory unnecessarily. Like you have enough registers, but the, the compiler is not using them properly. It doesn't realize that you can that there exists a register allocation that would that would allow it to uh, avoid spilling into onto the memory stack. Yeah. So um, we've observed that firsthand, and it's you know it's awful. And uh, the 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 horrible thing about that, of course, is that you have no control over it, right? It, it's a bug in the compiler. You did everything right on your end with the intrinsics, but. So that's one of the reasons we like to write in uh, inline assembly is because there's no room for the compiler to uh, trip up. Now, another, you could go further and say, well, what if you wrote a tool that, that would output the assembly for you? And we actually have collaborators who have looked into that. They, uh, uh, his name is Richard Veras at Carnegie Mellon University, or at least he was at CMU. Uh, he wrote a little tool that basically the idea was that it would automatically generate the microkernel code based on a few parameters that you would input. And of course, it would have to just intrinsically know about the x86 assembly. Uh, so if you were going to take it to a new machine, of course, you would have to you know, teach it the, the syntax, the instructions on that architecture. But all of that aside, it was a pretty neat concept, but I'm not sure he ever took it to completion. Um, so, so people have looked at it, but it, I don't know that we have a tool that's ready to use uh, sort of day to day for the purposes of writing microkernels. If, if you can make a comment about that, there is the code grommets that they do have some sort of tools for writing there, what's called the non-modded kernels. So that they just implement in the new architecture, they just implement the, this library and then just write how the, 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 the intrinsic should be called and then they generate the microcodes for them. So the kernels, they, they just support a new architecture very fast by uh -huh. using leverage this tool that they have written for themselves. Okay. But that case yeah. is very specific. It's very specific for molecular dynamics applications and their kernels that they, they are implementing. So it's not so generic, like could be used by you. I don't see any other reason hands. If, I, if you allow me, I can have a third question. Sure, go ahead. So the, the, you, there's a problem about supporting these, all these architectures, right? So then you, you showed uh, results for Zen, Zen 2, but do you support everything like Art, uh, ARM, and also all, all, the, all the other Intel x86 uh, uh, architectures or, or just, it's just like, a, it's a slow pacing, uh, how can I say, support? Yeah, so here's, this is a, just a rough, oh, okay. uh, rough estimate of what we support currently. I would say that we do support Zen 3, but we don't have it officially supported yet. So um, there's, there's nothing about Zen 3, to my knowledge, that, we would, that prevents Bliss from running on it, uh, in case, you know, that was something your, your eyes zoomed in on. But um, yeah, but yeah, so, it, you know, the support is quite wide. Uh, it's not, most of it is level three support. So we may be missing like some Axby kernels or some kernels for like matrix vector multiplication. But, uh, and that's, that's really just a function of not having the manpower, you know, cause we have to maintain the, the framework itself and, uh, and, and other things aside from just providing the, the, the architecture specific kernels, but uh, you know, we've over the years we've cobbled together qu quite a bit of support. Okay, thank you very much. Certainly, yes. I see Oka is, is raising his hand uh, again. We're ten minutes to the next talk, so I suggest we move this into the breakout room if people have more questions for field. If you're okay with that field. Oh, absolutely. Just tell me what breakout room to go into. Uh, there's only I'll, one. I'll, I'll send you over there. Yeah, oh, great. Okay, can, can pull you in there. Yeah, so if anyone wants to 
Um, listen into the follow-up with Phil. Feel free to jump to the breakout room. <laughs>